I'm standing at the bottom of a lake right now. Mind blown! These are the remains of a brick kiln that was put out of commission in 1980. From the late 1800s to the early 1900s, the Hudson Valley of New York State was the brick-making capital of the world. This industry is history to us now, seen in black and white photographs, ruins of brickyard buildings, and brick buildings we walk by on the street. But although it seems like the distant past, this story goes back much further than the 1700s and 1800s. I'm going to bring you on a journey back thousands of years, starting during the last ice age. The last ice age started 2.6 million years ago. During this time, there were several ice sheets that extended and retreated over the land in cycles. The most recent ice sheet that blanketed much of North America was the Laurentide ice sheet. The ice did a little dance where it extended and grew over the landscape in colder periods and then melted and retreated in warmer times. Until about 10,000 years ago, this ice dominated pretty much all of New York, and when it melted, left behind tons of evidence that it was here. You can see clues left behind of the ice's advances and retreats all over New York and the Northeast, like glacial erratics, grooves carved into bedrock, waterfalls and streams, lakes, mountainsides where bedrock was plucked away by glaciers, mountain peaks carved that way by ice, and so much more. So I'm in Hudson, New York right now, and I am walking on a trail in a conservation area where Lake Albany once existed, and this whole area was once completely underwater. Right now it's kind of underwater because it's really muddy. <laughs> But all of this, this whole flat area, this field used to be part of Lake Albany and where I'm walking is actually, I think used to be a delta where a stream used to empty out into the lake. So this all used to be underwater and it's really cool. There's all these birds everywhere. There's all these plants. And it wasn't that long ago that it was part of a lake. So what does all of this have to do with bricks? Well, think about the main ingredient of bricks, clay. I am currently standing at the bottom of Lake Albany. Behind me, as you can see, is this huge deposit of clay. And in front of me, behind you, is the modern day Hudson River. So before the Hudson River formed, it was a giant lake. At the end of the last ice age, there was a ton of meltwater from the ice sheet melting and all that meltwater had to go somewhere. So there were these depressions left in the land from the weight and pressure of all that ice for thousands of years that all that meltwater went into. And for thousands of years, this lake, Lake Albany existed and deposited all these layers of clay, all this sediment at the bottom of that lake. That's what you see behind me. And that's why we had such a booming brick industry here in the Hudson Valley. For hundreds of years, this lake existed until one day a sediment dam near modern day New York City broke and sent thousands upon thousands of gallons of water rushing all at once out into the Atlantic. Long story short, that lake became what we now know as the Hudson River. You can find many remnants of this lake all over the Hudson Valley, like at this mansion and historic site, which sits on top of an old delta. As you can see, these lakes left behind an enormous amount of clay. Why is that? Well, when the ice sheet would advance in colder periods, it bulldozed any of the topsoil of the land it covered. A lot of the sediment and rock would end up collecting in front of the ice or in the bottom layers of it. A lot of that material was ground down into tiny particles of sediment as the ice continued to advance and sculpt over the landscape. Once the ice melted in warmer periods, like on the final retreat of the ice sheet about 12,000 years ago, all that sediment would be left behind and deposited at the bottom of these glacial lakes. If you're used to watching my videos or if you're used to learning and talking about geology, usually we're talking about things on time scales that are much larger. Like a lot of the time in my videos, I'll talk about things that happened 200 million years ago or 500 million years ago or even a billion years ago. And this is so different because this happened like 15 to 18,000 years ago, which is obviously still a long time for us humans. But geologically speaking, this was like a second ago. I can't snap. So what exactly is clay? Clay is a fine grained sediment made up mostly of very tiny aluminum silicate particles. There are lots of ways that clay can form, like from volcanic ash or the weathering and erosion of rocks, or in this scenario, the transport and deposition by glaciers and their meltwater. Clay particles are extremely small. If you were to zoom in on a particle of sand and then compare it to a particle of clay, the sand would be roughly as big as a beach ball, whereas the clay would be the size of a dime. 
Clay is a huge part of human history. While you're watching this video, are you drinking coffee or tea out of a mug? Many mugs are made from clay. The earliest ceramics have been dated to around 14,000 BC, and bricks have been made and used as building materials for thousands of years. There are also endless ways that clay is currently used, from modern day ceramics, bricks, cement, even the paper and paint making processes. A big reason for this is because of how clay interacts with water. Depending on the type of clay, when mixed with water, it can expand, become very plastic and oh sticky. Oh. This makes it useful for many different things. I'm standing at the bottom of a lake. <laughs> oh, my poor bloodstones. Oh my God. <laughs> ah, look at that. This is, this is a great example of why this clay was perfect for making bricks. Okay, so I just got a piece of clay and it is so cool because I'm playing around with it and it's literally like Play-Doh, Clay-Doh. <laughs> I just love being able to tangibly hold pieces of the past and know how they got here. I got the chance to visit the Haverstraw Brick Museum where I was given a really great in-depth tour and history lesson by Rachel, the museum's executive director. If you want to learn about the history of the Hudson Valley brick industry, Haverstraw is the place to go. This town on the banks of the Hudson in Rockland County is the birthplace of the Hudson Valley brick industry. In 1771, Dutch settler Jacob Van Dyke started the first brickyard using heat from ovens to temper the clay. In 1815, coal dust was added to the brick recipe by James Wood, reducing the firing time of the bricks by half, in turn dramatically reducing fuel consumption. The brick industry really took off after the Wall Street Fire in 1835 and the Second Great Fire in 1845. This created new safety laws where the building materials of New York City buildings had to be fire resistant. Stone and brick were the preferred materials, with bricks being much cheaper than natural stone. Making bricks is sort of like baking, an analogy that Rachel used when describing the process to me. The recipe has different ingredients, wet and dry. First, the dry ingredients are mixed together, clay, sand, coal dust. Once the dry ingredients were mixed together, water was then added. Then, a machine was used to mix all this together before pouring it into molds. The molded bricks were laid out to dry and then stacked into the kiln to burn, and lastly, left to cool. One of my favorite parts of the museum was seeing all the different bricks on display from brickyards all over the Hudson Valley. You'll notice that each brick has its own stamp on it depending on where it was made. This indentation in the brick is called the frog, where each brickyard would then imprint their logo. When you walk along the shore of the Hudson and Haverstraw today, you'll find tons of bricks strewn about, many of them with the diamond logo of the Excelsior Brickyard. For a large part of the Hudson Valley's brick-making heyday, Haverstraw was the brick-making capital of the world. As technology continued to advance and brick-making became more efficient, more brickyards opened one by one. By 1860, over a hundred brickyards existed in the Hudson Valley, like the Hutton Brickyard in Kingston, about 70 miles north of Haverstraw. I am on a beach made up entirely of bricks, and these bricks were all made from the clay deposited by Glacial Lake Albany over 15,000 years ago, at the end of the last ice age. It's actually so crazy if you think about it because these bricks began as clays at the bottom of Glacial Lake Albany thousands and thousands of years ago. And then they were taken, like after the lake was gone, they were taken from these clay deposits along the shores of the Hudson River, turned into bricks, and then they were deposited when they were rejected and not used in buildings. They were deposited on this beach where they're now going to turn into like sediment again and go into the Hudson River and turn into something else, maybe a part of another rock. Obviously, all these bricks here say Hutton, or you can at least see part of it that says Hutton, which is the name of this brickyard that was stamped into the brick when it was made. So if this were used in a building in the city or somewhere else, you would know the brickyard it came from and exactly what location it came from and probably the clay deposit that it came from. 
and the clay deposits were a little bit different up and down the river. So the clay that made this brick is different than the clay that made Haverstraw bricks or other bricks down the river. Hutton Brickyards was the longest running brickyard in the Hudson Valley, opening in 1865 and closing its doors for good in 1980. It stayed abandoned for years until it was opened as a retreat and spa and event space. In between the newer, renovated buildings on the property, you can see the ruins of some buildings still standing from this time period. The most interesting to me are the huge steel-framed kiln sheds. When you look at them today, you see birds nesting, plants taking over, graffiti covering abandoned brick walls, and you hear the eerie creaking of old metal. But back in the day, it was a very different scene. Once molded bricks finished drying out in the sun, workers, mostly European immigrants, would build the kiln itself out of the bricks. In one kiln, about one million bricks could be fired at once, where they would bake for a week. After slowly cooling in the cooling sheds, the bricks were loaded onto a barge by this huge crane to be brought down to New York. Bricks made in the Hudson Valley were used in the Empire State Building, the American Museum of Natural History, the Brooklyn Bridge, and so much more. By the early 20th century, over 1 billion bricks per year were sent to New York City from the Hudson Valley, and it's estimated by historians that between 28 and 56 billion bricks were needed to fulfill construction needs just in Manhattan. Starting in World War I, the industry began its decline as more modern building materials like steel and concrete became available and affordable. By the end of World War II, only 10 brickyards were left in the Hudson Valley, and in 1979, the last bricks at Hutton Brickyards were fired. This story is one of many that opens my eyes to the endless ways that we humans are connected to our planet's past. Although we may not have personally been there to watch these geologic events happen, we can still be a witness to them by learning their stories through the buildings around us. I just think that it's so cool that we can walk into an old brick building and know that at some point the clay in those bricks was at the bottom of an ancient lake. I hope this has given you a new perspective of brick buildings, even if you've never been to New York City or the Hudson Valley. Whether it's the clay from Lake Albany or another clay deposit somewhere else in the world, bricks are just another fascinating way that we can learn about the distant past through things that we see and interact with every single day.